Remember, Dr. Lake is sharing her expertise. Any information from tonight or questions pertaining to individual concerns should be discussed with your personal doctor. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Diana Lake. Dr. Lake is a medical oncologist with a practice that is devoted solely to the care of breast cancer patients. Her research interests involve all areas of breast cancer, but focus mainly on the development of new therapies, prevention of cancer recurrence following surgery, and treatment of recurrent disease. Working in conjunction with her colleagues at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and as the liaison in breast medicine to a I'm sorry, to Alliance for Clinical Trials in Oncology. Dr. Lake is involved in clinical trials to develop better hormonal therapies and improved approaches to treatment before surgery. Dr. Lake, I turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity um, to meet with you guys and, and speak this evening. Um, we have a tall order to give you an update of all of endocrine therapy, so I think I'm going to concentrate mainly in early stage disease. Uh, because there are several important issues related to questions that patients often ask. And also will, however, mention a little bit about metastatic disease. Next slide, please. Um, so I have no disclosures. Next, please. Um, so the objectives of today in the, in the world of adjuvant hormonal therapy are, one, to discuss the issues of tamoxifen versus an aromatase inhibitor. Now, this mainly applies um, we used to say, to the premenopausal women because traditionally premenopausal women receive tamoxifen and postmenopausal women receive aromatase inhibitors, although now I think we know it's just important to have endocrine therapy. The duration of treatment is also something that I would like to address, and it's, it, it's less clear-cut with the aromatase inhibitors than it is with tamoxifen and, of course, the role for ovarian suppression. And as I mentioned, I would discuss um, a word or two about metastatic breast cancer and endocrine therapy only because we're starting to look at some of those drugs or some of those combinations earlier in the treatment, so in the adjuvant setting. Next, please. So this is a slide that we, we always start out with, and you'll see lots of graphs and words in, in today's slides. They're not meant for you to, um, to memorize. It's just uh, to illustrate a point. So this is a, a slide that shows on two different, uh, two different sets of curves. Um, one is um, showing the effect of tamoxifen on recurrence, and then on the right-hand side, it's on the effect of breast cancer mortality. You can see that in terms of recurrence, if you've been on tamoxifen for five years and then you evaluate patients at the 15-year point, there's really a gain of about 11 to 12 percent in terms of recurrence. So you, you have a 11 to 12 percent benefit in, in decreasing recurrences. And in terms of the overall mortality, you're really gaining about 10, 9 to 10 percent. So the use of endocrine therapy for five years, which was reported years ago, showed that there is a benefit for uh, tamoxifen at that time was the main drug. Next, please. There are... Um, with the advent of the development in a postmenopausal of aromatase inhibitors, um, we try to look at that and to uh, randomize or, or have clinical trials that address an aromatase inhibitor versus tamoxifen. And we started out only in postmenopausal women. So to date, there have been numerous combinations. There's been a direct comparison where you can compare tamoxifen and an aromatase inhibitor, and there are about three trials there. You see ATAC looked at anastrozole, big looked at uh, letrozole, and APSUG uh, looked at exemestane. We looked at it at the switching point. In other words, you start out on tamoxifen, maybe after two to three years you switch over to an aromatase inhibitor or continue with tamoxifen, and then numerous trials which address that issue. The extended adjuvant trial looked at someone who had been on endocrine therapy for five years, tamoxifen, or uh, tamoxifen followed by an AA. And then at the end of five years, they were randomized to placebo because that was the standard of care, nothing after five years. We're continuing on again uh, with five more years of hormonal therapy. And then the BIG-98 trial looked at sequencing. Does it matter if you start out with tamoxifen and switch over to an AI, or can you start with an AI and switch to tamoxifen? 
And no matter what, all of these trials boil down to one central point, that an aromatase inhibitor at any point in a postmenopausal woman was better than tamoxifen alone. Next, please. So the early breast trialist group really looked at patients, and they found that at 20, excuse me, at 20 years, there was about a 21% recurrence rate, 7% of which were local recurrences or, or contralateral breast cancer, and 14% were distant recurrences. So when you wonder, well, what's my risk of recurrence each year? It's somewhere about uh, one and a half to uh, close to 2% annually. Next, please. So there are numerous trials which then support the, the use of this extended adjuvant therapy. If we know that you have a one and a half to 2% risk of recurrence annually, it would make sense to wonder what happens if I take endocrine therapy longer. So with tamoxifen, there's the ATOM trial and the ATLAS trial, and then there was the MA17 and the MA17R, which went even beyond 10 years. And notice the effect here shows that there is a statistically significant greater impact after 10 years of endocrine therapy. So clearly this data in all of these trials, both the MA17 trial looked at aromatase inhibitors, the ATOM and ATLAS trial looked at tamoxifen, showing that longer duration of therapy was better. Next, please. So the schema, I keep mentioning the MA17R, was that patients um, were going to be on an AI for five years previous to um, the, the trial randomization. So one could have been on tamoxifen if you were premenopausal for any number of years usually up to five, but it could have been four to six. Then they were on an aromatase inhibitor of letrozole. And following this, after five years average of letrozole, patients were randomized to two and a half milligrams standard dose for another five years or placebo. So theoretically, one could have been on hormonal therapy for 15 years, five of tamoxifen, five of letrozole, and another five of letrozole if you were in that group. So that was called the extended adjuvant. And again, the whole basis of longer-term endocrine therapy is really based on the fact that patients with ER-positive breast cancer are at risk long-term, in contrast to ER-negative. Next, please. So the primary endpoint analysis was the five-year disease-free survival. And you see in the group, that had letrozole for the extra five years versus the placebo, there was a 95% disease-free interval with letrozole, 91 placebo. That was statistically significant. Anything that um, uh, less than 0 .005, 0 0.05 is statistically significant. So in this trial, there was actually a 34% reduction in recurrences. So that, that was good, and that's what led to us now looking at extended adjuvant therapy defined as five more years of um, hormonal treatment after the first five. Next, please. The next question, since we were doing so well with aromatase inhibitors, but remember that was, that was limited to the postmenopausal population, what about the premenopausal woman? Traditionally, a premenopausal woman received tamoxifen, and that was the only option. So there were two trials that ultimately combined their results in order to come up with some type of guidelines. They were called the SOFT trial and the TEX trial. The only difference is the SOFT trial randomized hormonal therapy uh, up front, that is less than 12 weeks from surgery if you didn't have chemo. If you did have chemo, it was right after chemotherapy. Patients had ovarian suppression. The arms were ovarian suppression versus TAM, tamoxifen, versus ovarian suppression and an aromatase inhibitor, exemestane, versus the standard of care in a premenopausal woman, woman with tamoxifen. And extended adjuvant, that is treatment beyond five years, was really defined per the, the treating physician. The TEXT trial also randomized up front, everybody was randomized up front 
uh, less than 12 weeks from surgery. If patients had chemotherapy, it was optional. If they were, they all started with ovarian suppression with the chemotherapy. Three arms were the same. Ovarian suppression, exomethane, ovarian suppression, tamoxifen. Patients were allowed to have a BSO, uh, uh, that is a oophorectomy, after being on treatment six months, and then they too would be randomized per physician uh, to extended adjuvant. Next, please. So what you found in the SOFT trial, low-risk patients, those who did not have chemo, no negative, no matter what you did, no matter which arm you were on, those patients do well. They could have been on tamoxifen, tamoxifen ovarian suppression, or ovarian suppression and an aromatase inhibitor. And you see here that their five-year distance metastatic free survival, the time to having metastases within five years, was all about the same. If we looked at the high-risk group, defined as those who received chemotherapy in that trial, then we knew that ovarian suppression versus aromatase inhibitor is better than tamoxifen. Ovarian suppression with tamoxifen was better than tamoxifen. And so, but the difference between the ovarian suppression with the aromatase inhibitor being better than tamoxifen and ovarian function suppression better than tamoxifen, it's a greater difference with the AI, aromatase inhibitor. So the real choices might boil down to ovarian suppression uh, and an aromatase inhibitor versus tamoxifen. The, OI, the AI was better. In a really high-risk premenopausal woman, that's a woman who's under 35, who has no positive disease, and who received chemotherapy. You can see here that their five-year breast cancer survival with ovarian suppression and an aromatase inhibitor is 83%. The five-year cancer-free survival with tamoxifen is 68%. So there is a statistically significant difference, and that's a rule that we pretty much adhere to now. So if you're a young premenopausal woman with high-risk disease who needs endocrine therapy, then this may very well be offered to you. Next, please. Um, this is just a, in graph form so that you can see the ovarian suppression in TAM versus TAM with a median follow-up of 67 months. Uh, the the um, the tamoxifen group um, had a slightly less uh, disease-free survival than tamoxifen and ovarian suppression, and that's in the red. Next, please. Uh, we talked about the final the analysis already, so we don't have to go into that. It really is just another way of saying the same thing. Next, please. Um, uh, there is a. If you want to know ovarian function suppression with uh, with an AI being better than ovarian and tamoxifen, there's a four percent improvement in the disease-free survival. But notably, there is no difference in the overall survival. So in that particular trial, you're not going to live any longer, but you may have a you would have a better uh, you would have an improvement in your disease-free survival. Next, please. So the next trial that was, that was most anticipated and really um, everyone was excited about, and that's the Taylor X trial, because we're going, we're going now to another question. We know how well patients do with endocrine therapy. We've touched on whether or not you should uh, give endocrine therapy long-term, like greater than five years. We know that in postmenopausal women, um, an aromatase inhibitor is better than tamoxifen, and we know that high-risk premenopausal women can be offered ovarian suppression, i.e. being made menopausal, and then receive a, an aromatase inhibitor. So the next logical question is, well, if we can do so well with our hormonal therapy, does everybody really, does everyone really need chemotherapy because patients are getting a lot of chemotherapy? And so there was a test which was called the Oncotype DX, which I was not going into tonight, but I think you're probably all familiar that this is a panel, uh, it's, a, it's a 21 gene assay. So your tumor is taken, a biopsy or a sample of your tumor is taken, and it's sent off for a genomic analysis, which looks at genes for estrogen, genes for progesterone, normal growth factors, and other things. 
so 21 different genes. Depending upon the expression, this is all put into an equation, and ultimately you come up with a number, and that number is called the recurrence score. And the number can range anywhere from zero to um, 100. And there, the, there, it divides breast cancer in those who are at low risk for recurrence, intermediate risk for recurrence, and high risk. And the lower risk patients, we know you can treat with endocrine therapy alone. The high risk patients, it's proven, we need chemo and endocrine. But what we didn't know is what to do with that intermediate risk group. Uh, do they all require uh, chemotherapy, or can we leave chemotherapy out in a subset of these patients? So the Taylor X trial was a trial designed to answer that question. It stands for Trial of Finding Individualized Options for Treatment. Next, please. Uh, the patients were all women with invasive breast cancer. They were between 70, 18 and 75. The Taylor X was for node negative patients. The ER and PR or ER or PR uh, had to be positive in the local lab. The local lab also checked for HER2, so HER2 should have been negative, but there was not central testing for that. The other key thing is the tumor size in Taylor X. Uh, the cutoff was five centimeters for the largest size, so we didn't really look at very large uh, tumors, like over five centimeters. And you were allowed to enroll on the trial if your tumor was under a centimeter, but if you had an intermediate to a high nuclear grade. So depending on how aggressive uh, the, the tumor was. Also, all the patients who entered into the trial had to be willing to undergo chemotherapy. Next, please. Um, again, that's what, uh, we, this slide depicts what we just said. Arm A, low risk group, endocrine alone. Arm D, high risk group, endocrine and chemo, and arm uh, B and C was the experimental arm. Arm B, truly the experimental arm, treating these patients with endocrine therapy alone. And arm C, they had this, the patients received the standard of care, which was endocrine and chemo. Next, please. And the endpoints uh, were uh, the primary endpoint. Uh, was the invasive disease-free survival in the patients that had this intermediate um, score. That would mean distant invasive uh, recurrence, a local regional invasive, contralateral invasive, or any other second primary cancer, and obviously uh, death. And then um, the um, uh, recurrence scores that were between 0 and 10, the End point here was the distant recurrence-free survival, and um, the relapse-free survival is something that was also looked at. Next, um, so the most common, remember I said the patients had to be willing to accept chemotherapy if they were uh, offered it. So the most common regimens were TC, which is a very popular regimen in the, in the country, and that's taxotere and others especially on the East Coast, anthracycline-containing regimens of uh, adriamycin, cytoxan, and taxane. Next, please. Um, if we look at the primary endpoint of the invasive disease-free survival, the difference between arms B and C, endocrine alone versus chemo and endocrine, these lines are superimposed. Secondary endpoint, distant relapse-free survival, again, the lines are superimposed. Next, please. Uh, if we look at all four arms, A, B, and C, essentially are going to involve endocrine therapy alone, endocrine alone, or chemo and endocrine. Those lines, the top ones here on the right, all superimposed. The line in pink represents arm D, and that is the high-risk uh, patient defined as having a recurrence score in this trial of 25 to 100. So that tells you that we... We really, I mean, and the risk of recurrence is about 13%. So then we, we have room for improvement in terms of the chemo um, status. If we look at the nine-year event rates, and that's exactly what was uh, published in June of this year and presented at the oncology meeting, and that is for the low-risk patient, nine-year event rates 
score between 0 and 10, 3% distant recurrence with endocrine therapy alone. This was initially reported three years ago in the New England Journal, and the number has held. Uh, if your recurrence score is 11 to 25, again, there's no real significant difference. In other words, it's less than 1% difference in all these endpoints. And of course, if you look at the higher recurrence scores, there's a 13% distant recurrence despite chemo and endocrine therapy. Next, please. So the, the question that, that came up and that arose out of the Taylor X is, is there any subgroup in that intermediate group that might benefit from chemotherapy? So the main thing that, that one looked at, again, it boils down to age. And what about women who have an intermediate score that are younger? Um, they are um, under the age of 50. So they, they chose menopause as being 50. And people who are over 50, there is no chemo benefit um, at all in any of the um, any of the endpoints that were looked at. But in patients who are under 50, having a score anywhere from 16 to 25, there may be a benefit. Next, please. So, what it turned out was again 16 to 25. There's some chemo benefit, perhaps in women under the age of 50. Um, there were 9% fewer invasive disease-free events, including 2% fewer distant recurrences. And if your score was between 21 and 25, uh, there were 6% fewer uh, invasive disease-free um, um, recurrences, or excuse me, 6% uh, fewer um, distant recurrences. So I think the bottom line is and, and the summary slides and, and the results from the Taylor X, if your score is under 15, you're doing well, no chemotherapy benefit. If your score is between 16 to 25, these are all guidelines, and especially if your score is 21 to 25, there are fewer distant recurrences here, 6 to 7%, so you may benefit. If you're 16 to 20, you also may benefit. And I think Patients having that score between 16 and 25 need to sit down with their physician and really discuss their thoughts, and the physicians would discuss um, the data with the patient. Remember, at all times, the treatment with your doctor is like a partnership. So that it's, it's an ongoing discussion uh, to review data and, and do what you think is best after you've been educated regarding the, thought, the, uh, the facts. Next, please. I think we've summarized that. Next, please. So I, this is just a slide to remind us. Some of you may actually have participated in the Taylor X trial, so we wish to thank you and all of the other volunteers and anyone who participates in clinical trials because you're usually you're 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 actually helping science and you're helping both yourselves as per, perhaps as well as other patients and future generations, so that we can have and offer the best treatment to our patients. So we thank you. Next, please. So I want to say a word or two about the metastatic setting. Next, please. Um, the, the main drugs that I'm going to talk about are the cyclin uh, CD4, K, CDK4-6. Those are kinase inhibitors. Next, please. Talbocyclic was the first one, and it preferentially inhibits the growth of ER-positive cells. That's the bottom line from this particular um, uh, slide. Next, please. So you see advertised on television, I'm sure. Some of you may be on uh, palbocyclin. The other name for it is Ibrant. It's an oral drug. It prevents cell cycle progression from G1 to the S phase. So, you know, the cell goes through a, a cycle uh, of growth. There's growth, there's, there's rest, there's, there's um, uh, division, and so forth. And so what this does is it, it lets all the cells pile up so they, after a gap, they can't go on to the S phase. So think of like a, a car is going down the highway and, the, and you hit to, get to a toll and the gate is down. You can't go. So everybody's piling up behind that gate. Um, and that's what the, the CDK4-6 inhibitor does. Um, next, and so in very small concentrations, it was really able to to have an effect on cells. Next, please. 
Um, and some of the trials to initially study this, or one of the trials, was the Paloma 1. So the Paloma 1, and why everybody became very excited, in metastatic breast cancer first line, we would commonly go to an aromatase inhibitor if one hadn't had one before. And one of the drugs at the time when this trial was starting that we looked at was letrozole. So the Paloma 1 took the aromatase inhibitor letrozole as one arm, added on palbocyclib, and then wanted to know, is there any benefit in progression-free survival or events? And look what happened. With letrozole alone in the blue, the median progression-free survival was 10 months. With palbocyclib added to letrozole, 20 months median survival. So this was extremely exciting. The overall response rate was 43% with the combination versus 33% with letrozole alone. Next, please. Side effects, because everybody's concerned about side effects that you expect here. Uh, there are some. And the major one is low blood count. So if you look here, neutropenia, grades 1, 2, 3, much higher than someone who gets letrozole alone. Fatigue, also more uh, grade 1 and 2 and 3 than letrozole alone. And patients can, can also get arthralgias. So certainly with the aromatase inhibitors, one of the big problems is joint pain and stiffness. You can get similar symptoms with um, with uh, the, the letrozole, with, excuse me, with palbocyclic. The important thing to note here is that about 40 to 45% of the patients actually required a delay in treatment or a reduction in the dose. But the good part is the low white count is self-limited. So it's not the same as the low white count that you have when you're on chemotherapy. Next, please. The, uh, the, the next step was to look at second line. So we, we commonly had letrozole as a, as a primary, and fulvestrant is a, a drug that's an injection, and it destroys the estrogen receptor, and it was commonly used as second line metastatic disease. And again, when we combined palbo cyclic with fulvestrant versus fulvestrant alone, median progression-free survival nine months versus four, doubling, doubling the median progression-free survival. So we see this in both first and second line treatment. Next, please. Neutropenia is the same. Uh, it, it's not uncommon to have grade three. You can get some grade four. The nadir uh, usually occurs um, weeks three to four. Um, we see it usually around week two that you can see at the end of week two, which is why uh, you always get a, a count check with, within the first two cycles on day 14. The duration of the neutropenia is short, and it's rare but can happen that patients will get febrile neutropenia. Next, please. This slide on the right will really list here the three um, kinase inhibitors, Palbo, the first to come out, ribocyclob, the second, and abamacyclob, the last one and most recent. So those are all the CDK4-6 inhibitors. Next, please. The Mona Lisa 2 study was, and these trials do have odd names, but Mona Lisa 2 looked at ribocyclob because the LEE011 is the, um, was the research name. Um, and again, patients took ribocyclob the same, the same schema as the palbocyclob, three weeks on, one week off, with letrozole um, versus uh, placebo and letrozole and um, showing that there was clearly a benefit with the ribocyclob. Next, please. The characteristics of the two treatment arms were, were very similar. Next, please. Um, again, there was an improvement. As you can see here, the ribocyclob and letrozole is better in terms of uh, progression-free survival um, in contrast to uh, letrozole alone. So here, the second trial that's also showing, um, it was 73% progression-free survival for the ribo arm uh, versus 61 for those who did not receive it. Next, please. Side effects, 
are the same, little nausea, little diarrhea with the ribo. The only other difference, it can elevate your liver function to a degree and cause some EKG changes. So that's why your physicians may uh, evaluate you for EKG changes. Ribocyclob has also now been approved. Next, please, uh, for use with tamoxifen. We talked about the hematologic side effects, which are absolutely the same. Uh, the neutropenia, anemia, so you can get cytopenia. Platelet counts are less so. Febrile neutropenia occurred in 1.5% of this trial. Uh, in the other trial, it was 1.9%, I believe. Next, please. Um, people always ask, well, what's the difference? This is a hard slide to read between the three inhibitors. They just have different side effects, but they're all quite effective. Um, I'm going to, sh next, please. Next, please, I think we talked about the main reason for reduction is, is really blood counts or, in the case of RIBO, the, um, the uh, liver function. Next, please. Uh, the bottom line is TALBO is approved, AI or fulvestrant. With TALBO, RIBO is approved for an AI and now I think also tamoxifen. The major side effects for everybody, neutropenia, uh, you can get um, pulmonary emboli in palbo, so that's something to keep in mind. So thrombotic events. Uh, with ribo, it's more uh, cardiac changes, liver function uh, changes. Next, please. Uh, so the other exciting trial is the Monarch 2. So the Monarch 2 was a bamacyclib, the third one, in combination with fulvestrant. Uh, and we're trying to see if that has a, a, a response. And it was studied, in, next please, in the exact same way. Um, patients were on abamacyclib with fulvestrant versus fulvestrant alone. Next, please. Um, we compared the Paloma 3, which is Palbo fulvestrant versus abamacyclib and fulvestrant. Next, please. And this is the key slide here. The median progression-free survival, remember how good it was with fulvestrant um, uh, sorry, we have fulvestrin and abamacyclib, median progression-free survival of 16.4 months, and fulvestrin alone is nine months. Next, please. The side effects, as you can see, are all manageable, and everybody benefited, no matter who you looked at, uh, whether they had responded before to endocrine therapy, the metastatic sites, measurable disease, age group, rates, performance status, Abamacyclib and fulvestrant was better than the placebo arm. Next, please. So the conclusions were that abamacyclib plus fulvestrant is certainly effective treatment. So you really have three different um, drugs that you can now give. Next, please. Next, please. So I mentioned the. Um, I mentioned the. Those two, those three drugs in the metastatic setting, because now we're beginning. If something works in the metastatic setting, we look at it in the adjuvant setting. And so the Palace study um, is a study that is ongoing. In fact, it's going to close probably the beginning of November, first week of November. And this really takes patients who have early stage breast cancer and they're randomized to endocrine treatment, any endocrine treatment, plus palbo versus endocrine treatment alone. The endocrine treatment is five years. You can go beyond physician choice. The palbo is only for two years. We have no results, but this is an ongoing study. Next, please. Next. So we then began, the last few slides are starting to answer some questions that we all have. And one of them is uh, how long should one stay on the extended adjuvant letrozole. So the ideal trial actually looked at tamoxifen versus an aromatase inhibitor versus a combination of them all. And then they were randomized to letrozole versus uh, letrozole, uh, excuse me, letrozole for two years versus letrozole for uh, five years. So it's two and a half versus five years. Next, please. And what you see if you're looking at the disease-free survival, the overall survival, or the distant metastases-free survival, there does not appear to be a difference at all um, between the two years and the five years. So five years of an AI 
in the ideal try was not necessarily better. Um, and so this is one of the first trials that's beginning to show us, at least with metastatic, uh, excuse me, with um, at, at least with um, postmenopausal women on aromatase inhibitors, that maybe 10 years uh, or less than 10 years may be enough. So we, we're not sure. And this too was recently reported. Next, please. The data study was a study from the Netherlands, and again. Uh, it tried to look, address the issue of three years of anastazole versus six years, and uh, patients received um, uh, endocrine therapy, uh, which was usually um, two to three years of tamoxifen, and then they were randomized to three years of an AI or six years of an AI. So for a couple of years or three years, everybody had the same treatment. And what they found here, that there was absolutely no difference at all uh, between the five years and the three years, except possibly in women who had no positive, uh, who had neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So perhaps longer aromatase inhibitors are better in the higher risk patients. Again, two to three years of tamoxifen, then they were on an AI and they continued the AI, tried to look at three versus six years. Maybe a difference in the patients who are high risk. Next, please. Um, next, please. Next, please. I don't need to go into all the details. So I think as, answering the question about extended aromatase inhibitors, there are several trials that show there's an, a benefit, MA17, NSABP, the initial exomestane trial. Um, there is also some benefit, but maybe not as great, looking at um, the IDEAL trial, the DATA trial. There's subsets who will benefit. And then these last two trials, the SOUL trial, which really address um, the, whether or not you need continuous treatment. Next, please. So the SOUL trial addressed another issue. Adjuvant endocrine therapy, do we need continuous versus five years, or can we have intermittent therapy on for nine months off, start again? Uh, it tried to address that issue, and ultimately the next, please. The disease-free and the overall survival are almost identical. So the SOUL trial tries to answer that question. I do not recommend that you, and I don't tell my patients uh, to, to interrupt either, I do not recommend having pulse aromatase inhibitor therapy. This was one particular trial. I think you have to study this more. But it does lead credence to the fact if you're having a hard time with your aromatase inhibitor and you need to take a break, and then restart with either another drug or, or a, a different schedule. You can do that, or you have to interrupt the surgery, reconstruction surgery. That's okay without any untoward effects. Next, please. And the last trial, the APSUG trial, which again looked at four to six years of endocrine therapy, TAM, AI, tamoxifen, then they were randomized to an anastrozole for two years versus five years. Um, showing that probably uh, there is, it's questionable. Next, please. If you look again at the disease-free survival, no difference. Overall survival, no difference. Short versus long. Next, please. Um, secondary endpoints of contralateral breast cancer versus a second primary breast cancer, nothing that is statistically significant at all between the two. Next, please. Um, but if you look at problems such as fractures, with longer-term aromatase inhibitor therapy, there is a higher fracture rate, and this is something that's real and clinically significant. So I think that needs to be taken into consideration. Next, please. So I think, again, uh, we're just about finished. The, um, if we look to address the issue of extended adjuvant therapy and we're looking at hazard ratios, um, certainly after tamoxifen for five years, there is a significant benefit with extended adjuvant as demonstrated in the MA17, the B33, and the ABCSG trial after two years of an AI. There's a modest to no benefit in the MA17R, the IDEAL, the DATA, the B42 trial. So again, there may be subgroups who benefit. And if we look at intermittent AI, 
uh, that's the same as continuous AI. There's only one trial, that was one report at San Antonio. I do not think that that should change the current practice at this moment. Next, please. So I think the final thoughts are aromatase inhibitors are better than tamoxifen alone. Sequencing treatment, a TAM to an AI, or you can start out on an AI, and this is important. Some of our patients will say, I just can't tolerate it. So going back to tamoxifen is an alternative because you've at least been on some AI. The results of an extended AI are mixed. There are multiple trial designs. The largest benefit is seen after prior tamoxifen exposure, not prior aromatase inhibitor exposure. So there's less or no benefit after that. The optimal duration of the AI is still unclear. We actually began to revisit this ourselves. And in patients who are deemed to be sufficiently high risk, that is positive nodes, poor risk features, um, perhaps there is a role for 10 years of the AI. And in the future, maybe genomic markers may help us to define which patients will derive more benefit. Next, please. Uh, this is just a summary slide of all of the trials that we went through tonight. I think we went through, a, next please, we went through a large number of trials, um, but they just illustrate certain principles. Uh, one, I, I think, is the importance of an AI. Two, uh, there are high-risk patients that, that you should consider longer treatment, but the AI story is still to be determined. Certainly, I mean, ovarian suppression with an aromatase inhibitor is better than tamoxifen alone in your premenopausal high-risk patient. Next, please. Next, please. Next. Next. And I want to thank you for... Thank you, Dr. Lake, for a wonderful and informative presentation. Uh, Dr. Lake, um, I've been on Arimidex, or I guess it's an estrozole, for nine years now. My question is, do we have research beyond 10 years? I've had a prior cancer. I had leukemia and a bone marrow transplant uh, back in 83, and then my breast cancer was in 09. I've had uh, a lot of chemotherapy, full-body radiation for the, for the uh, leukemia, and then for the uh, breast cancer, I did have chemo and radiation. I had 26 nodes that were um, cancerous. So what happens after 10 years? Should I stay on it, being a high so risk? I've also had a third cancer, um, endometrial. But that was, okay. that was stage one. <laughs> okay. There's no data at all. This is not an uncommon question. I mean, uh, personally, in my practice, I have a few patients who refuse to stop aromatase inhibitors. So as long as you understand that there is no data. The things that you have to follow, however, would be your bone density, and I know that you've had a lot of prior therapy, so um, you may have some of which may have affected your bone. So your bone health is very important. Remember that was shown in the ABCSG trial that longer AI was associated with a higher fracture risk. Uh, that's one. And the other thing is is cardiovascular risk because uh, aromatase inhibitors are associated with an increase in one's lipids. So that's something that you should discuss with your physician. What, what are your lipids? What's your bone health like? And, and make your decision. But there is no data of aromatase inhibitors greater than 10 years. Thank you. What do you mean by ovarian suppression? Do you mean surgery? No, ovarian suppression, there's several ways to do it. One is surgery, actually remove your ovaries, and the other is to give a medication that will shut down the ovaries so the ovaries will not produce estrogen. And what is that medication? Lupron, for example, is one such drug if you've ever heard of it. What's the name of the drug? Lupron. Oh, Lupron, yes. Okay. Thank you. No grapefruit is not advised if you are on tamoxifen. Is orange peel a risk? I've read some articles and seen some food lists that recommended avoiding tangerine, orange peels, and tea, for example. Can you comment on that? I can't. I was not aware of orange peel, certainly was not aware of tea, um, but grapefruit, yes. Grapefruit actually uh, uh, interferes with a lot of medications, not just the breast medications. I suggest that you speak with a nutritionist to ask that question, or your oncologist could connect you with a nutritionist. 
have there been any studies on women who choose not to take AIs due to osteoporosis? I have had endometrial cancer two times and lobular breast cancer recently. So if one has osteoporosis to begin with, uh, I think you have several options. Number one, uh, and you need endocrine therapy, number one would be um, an aromatase inhibitor along with a drug, a, what we call bone-modifying agent. So there was Zomata, zoledronic acid is one, and the other more modern drug is Prolia, which you may have seen advertisements on TV, uh, which is denosinab. The prolia is given one time every six months. Um, so you, you can certainly uh, consider that. Uh, the other thing, and we're learning now, if you have severe osteoporosis, remember all these trials show that it's just important that you have endocrine therapy. So we're not as dogmatic, even though I made a difference between pre- and postmenopausal. The bottom line is if you need endocrine therapy to be able to get it. And so, therefore, tamoxifen might be a good choice, and that's something that you need to discuss with your physician um, because tamoxifen helps to maintain or slightly increase. That means improve the bone density. And tamoxifen is even if you're postmenopausal? Yeah, that was the point that I was uh, – that, that's what I, I was just trying to say. Even though I made a point today and we divided everything into pre- and postmenopausal – status. The important thing, and those are guidelines, but the important thing is that if you need endocrine therapy that you get it. And so therefore, I would say if you need to have endocrine therapy, lobular carcinomas can respond uh, to endocrine. They're very responsive to endocrine. I would go ahead and do it. Um, but you, would, um, you might have to have a bone modifying agent okay. or tamoxifen. Typed in. Most data discussed had to do with HER2 negative tumors. What AI and CDK4 slash 6 inhibitors are available for HER2 positive metastatic cancers? So um, the CD4 6 kinase inhibitors in HER2 positive breast cancer are, I think there are a couple of clinical trials to, to address that issue. Uh, that's not the standard of care. I think we have so many. When you have HER2 positive breast cancer, um, you can really, you have something to target, and that's the HER2 receptor. Uh, so usually anti-HER2 therapy is included or HER2-directed therapy. Uh, for patients that are ER positive, HER2 positive, and um, let's say we're talking about uh, early stage disease, you've had your chemo, you've had your HER2-directed we place those patients on aromatase inhibitors if they're postmenopausal. I think you could, you could administer any endocrine therapy, meaning tamoxifen or an AI. There was one study in the 1990s uh, which looked at um, neoadjuvant, uh, I think it was letrozole was the drug, in patients who are HER2 positive. So the aromatase inhibitors may be a little better in the HER2, but the bottom line is you can administer HER2 positive uh, patients who are also ER positive any endocrine treatment. See? Hi, I know this is a, maybe a, a little off course, but what is the importance of vitamin D as far as breast cancer? I've been reading a lot about uh, vitamin D would, it would be very important for women that have had uh, breast cancer to keep their levels up above normal with vitamin D intake. So do you need vitamins? And then what if you can't uh, take the amount of milligrams that they say you need to take in order to keep that D level up? I have a question to answer back. What is the, what's the vitamin uh, D level that this article is, is quoting to you? Uh, the, uh, the, it said, I believe, that the blood test level for vitamin D would be 30 and that you should keep your blood level in the 50s. And in my case, let's say, if I were to take uh, 5,000 units of vitamin D a day, that would maybe push me up into the 50s. But to me, I feel that that would cause toxicity. 
Um, it, it doesn't. We usually are not giving vitamin D in relation to breast cancer management, but but vitamin D is part of bone health. You know, everyone used to be excited about vitamin D, thinking it also boosts one's immune system. But our recommendation is to give vitamin D to maintain a level above 30, along with calcium for one's bone health, oh. uh, especially if you're on an aromatase inhibitor. The prescription usually is exercise, 30 minutes, five days a week, moderate exercise, moderate defined as whatever raises your heart rate and makes you perspire. Mm-hmm. Um, Calcium, you should take, it's preferable to take it through nutrition like yogurt and milk, but you can also take a supplement. And vitamin D, the average being uh, 2,000 uh, milligrams a day. But, again, that depends on what your vitamin D level is. Mm-hmm. Many Thank people you. in North America are vitamin D deficient. I was lymph node cancer-free with my... Um, IDC, and I'm having a total hysterectomy. How long do I need to take an aromatase inhibitor? Uh, I can read that again. Node-free um, with uh, infiltrating ductal carcinoma and having a total hysterectomy. How long do I need to take an aromatase inhibitor? So, again, that's, that's a variable question. Because your nodes were, were clean, um, I don't know the size of your tumor, um, and that's something that you really have to discuss because the only thing, the hysterectomy, I presume when you had the hysterectomy, your ovaries were removed. I hope that's what you're saying. Um, so if your ovaries were removed, you are now postmenopausal, whereas before you were premenopausal. So you are just a, then become a node-negative postmenopausal woman. Uh, depending upon the size of the tumor and other features, uh, at least five years, we don't know about the, the, the um, and that was the point I was trying to make. We don't really know if it's necessary to take an AI for 10 years. And again, this is an ongoing discussion that you should have with your oncologist. Yes, and my question is, in terms of the AIs, is one better than another, or is it just a matter of tolerance? Uh, that's a nice question, and, and everyone asks that. One is not better than another, in my opinion. Um, there, there are two types of AIs. There's a steroidal, based on chemical formation, and a non-steroidal way of inhibiting. The non-steroidal becomes anastrozole, letrozole. They're identical drugs made by two different pharmac- pharmaceutical companies. The other drug, exemestane, is a steroidal type, but it's not better than the others. Some, theoretically, if you're having difficulty tolerating one and you switch to another, you should have the same difficulty. But um, sometimes patients don't, and so we do switch. Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Lake again for so generously sharing her time, expertise, dedication, and commitment to the breast cancer community, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Have a good night. Thank you very much, Dr. Lake. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity.